During the massive Allied combined air raids on Hamburg, window, the tiny strips of aluminum that mimicked airplanes, rendered the German radar ineffective. But neither the British nor even the Germans could have guessed that almost immediately a new and more effective system of night fighting would evolve. The code name Wildsau, German for Wild Sow, was derived from a slang term meaning roughly the same as loose cannon in English. The great advocate for Wildsau tactics was Major Hayu Hermann, himself a loose cannon by any standards of military discipline. He regarded the German Himmelblatt radar system as too limiting. He preached that standard single-seat day fighters could be flown at night against the Allied bomber formations. He tested his theory. In borrowed BF 109s and FW 190s, he waded into the British bomber stream, ignoring the German flag. He found that bombers were vulnerable to the day fighters if the searchlights caught them for as little as 30 seconds. It was risky. Nighttime takeoffs and landings were difficult in the German fighters. Exploding German flak did not distinguish between enemy bomber and friendly fighter. Twin engine fighters, Ju 88s and Bf 110s were introduced to the new system. The day fighters combined with the radar equipped night fighters to present the British with a new defensive problem. In 1943, the American 8th Air Force could only put 250 to 300 bombers into the air on a mission. But it remained determined to push its bomber offensive into Germany. There was no long-range fighter to escort the bombers. Spitfires and Republic P-47 Thunderbolts were only useful for sweeps over France. The Lockheed Lightning became available later in 1943. It could reach 600 miles when equipped with drop tanks, but the Lightning was never highly regarded as an air superiority fighter in European skies. General Aker was under increasing pressure to obtain results. General Half Arnold sent message after message criticizing the level of effort by the 8th. He demanded to know why more was not being done. He made unfavorable comparisons with the performance of other units. The aggressive Brigadier General William Kepner took over the 8th Fighter Command. Brigadier General Frank Armstrong took over 8th Bomber Command. On July 24, 1943, the 8th Air Force began what became known as Blitz Week. One of the strikes was a 1,900-mile round-trip attack on targets in Norway. It was the longest bombing raid up to that time. There were also attacks on German targets Kiel, Hanover, Hamburg, Kassel, and Vornemunde. 1,720 sorties were flown in the week. 8.5% of the 330 aircraft were lost. With other aircraft damaged, 8th Bomber Command was whittled down to less than 200 heavy bombers. The 8th was also expected to conduct raids outside the European theater. It contributed two bomb groups to take part with the 9th Air Force in the low-level raid on Ploesti, Romania. 
The oil fields at Ploesti provided Germany with 66% of its crude oil. The raid on August 1st was marred by lack of secrecy and inaccurate navigation. Damage to the oil fields was severe, but easily repaired. Follow-up attacks were too long in coming. Almost a third of the attacking planes were lost. On August 17th, a double strike was made on the ball bearing factories at Schweinfurt and the Messerschmitt factory at Regensburg. Almost nothing went well. Both the first and the fourth bombardment wings ran into continuous, well-disciplined fighter opposition. The fourth was strung out in a 15-mile column. It had only one group of P-47s as escort. The Germans began their attacks over Belgium. They concentrated on the rear units. This is a German fighter pilot's view of the last seconds in the life of an 8th Air Force B-17 and its crew. but 127 aircraft of the 4th Bombardment Wing hit the target. It was precision bombing of the first order. 300 tons of bombs devastated the Messerschmitt works. Production of BF-109s was disrupted for five months. Perhaps even more important, the fuselage jigs for the Messerschmitt Me-262 jet fighter were destroyed. But when Curtis LeMay led his force on over the Alps to land in North Africa, 24 aircraft, almost 19% of the wing, had been lost. Meanwhile, the first bombardment wing put 183 bombers over the Schweinfurt factories. Opposition was heavy all the way in and all the way out. 36 aircraft were lost, almost 20%. Schweinfurt was a significant victory for the Luftwaffe. 60 aircraft were shot down. Another 30 had to be left in North Africa because of battle damage. 28 of those that got back to England were heavily battered. The German Air Force had shown that it was still a dangerous opponent. On the night of August 17th, the RAF made a devastating attack on Pinamunda, 
where the secret development of the German V1 and V2 vengeance weapons was taking place. A diversion by eight RAF mosquitoes tricked the Nazi air defense system into ordering 200 fighters to Berlin and made the task of the attacking force easier. Göring was infuriated by the trick. He blasted his chief of staff, Jaschonek, holding him personally responsible. Jaschonek shot himself. His suicide note said, I cannot work with Göring anymore. Long live the Führer. The 8th Air Force losses at Regensburg and Schweinfurt slowed the rate of attacks. But in the second week of October 1943, precision bombing came into its own. In three days, more than 1,000 bombers were dispatched against targets in Germany. At Marienburg, every bomb landed in the target area. None hit the town. On October 14th, the 8th Air Force went back to Schweinfurt. When their P-47 escort turned back, the Luftwaffe attacked the bomber stream all the way to the target and back to the coast. The Luftwaffe expertly coordinated rocket attacks with air-to-air -air bombing and massed attacks by cannon-armed fighters. They savaged the 8th's formations. A total of 60 aircraft were shot down out of the 229 attacking. It was an unbearable loss rate of 26.5%. No air force could sustain such losses. The Luftwaffe had achieved day air superiority. The Allied commanders were stunned by the defeat. The Luftwaffe was not being worn into the ground. It was getting stronger by day and by night. The Allies had underestimated German aircraft production capacity. They had overestimated the claims of German aircraft destroyed in battle. Air superiority had to be won back from the Germans. That could only be done with the help of a long-range escort fighter. Bad weather halted deep penetrations into Germany by the 8th Air Force for the remainder of 1943. The invasion of Europe depended on securing air superiority from the Luftwaffe, but the Germans were achieving a production miracle that would see 44,000 airplanes produced in 1944. The improved versions of the FW-190 and the BF-109 were the equal of the best American fighters. They had proved themselves deadly against the bombers. New training methods were improving the quality of German pilots. All of this had an effect on the American leadership. On December 23rd, General Aker was relieved as commanding general of the 8th Air Force. He was given a more prestigious position, but he knew he was being kicked upstairs. Aker fought hard against the move, coming as it did just as his resources were beginning to increase. But a good soldier to the end, he accepted the position of commander, Mediterranean Allied Air Forces. Meanwhile, in the fall of 1943, Allied troops, fresh from victories in North Africa and Sicily, had moved well up the Italian peninsula toward Rome. General Hap Arnold decided to split the 12th Air Force into two parts. On November 1st, 1943, Major General James Doolittle was given command of the 15th. 12th Bomber Command became the 15th Air Force, strategic, a heavy bomber unit. 12th Fighter Command became the 12th Air Force, tactical. Arnold reasoned that England was already overcrowded and would have difficulty supporting more aircraft. 
bases in Italy would offer better weather. Winston Churchill had long called for airstrikes against Berlin. Sir Arthur Harris and General Karl Spatz believed that if Berlin were destroyed, it would not be necessary to invade the continent. They may well find it impossible to recover. Remember, von Mamer, the pilots are depending on you to take them right into the aiming point. RAF Bomber Command began its preliminary offensive against Berlin in late August 1943. Bomber Command's strength was about twice that of the American 8th Air Force, and it was growing fast. Tactics had been improved. The bomber stream was no longer an endless 300 mile smorgasbord of targets. It had become a dense wedge, three miles across and 70 miles long, able to cross a city in 22 minutes. New electronic countermeasures could pick up emissions from an enemy night fighter's radar. British radio operators fluent in German gave false instructions to Luftwaffe night fighters. But the results of the first heavy raids on Berlin in the late summer of 1943 were not encouraging. The Luftwaffe had recovered its night fighting prowess. It was now supplementing the Waldsau tactics with Tamesau methods. Twin engined night fighters were inserted into the bomber stream to acquire targets on their own radar sets. The ground based observer corps became much more important. It was provided with modern radar to help with the new plotting and control system. This is a captured Heinkel HE219 OWL night fighter. It handled superbly, was fast and had excellent radar. It was heavily armed with six 20 mm cannon. In the end, only 268 were built, but those that reached squadron service wrought havoc on the bomber streams. The heavy losses in the August raid on Berlin had not deterred Sir Arthur Harris. On November the 3rd, he wrote to Churchill, we can wreck Berlin from end to end if the USAAF will come in on it. It will cost between 400 and 500 aircraft. It will cost Germany the war. But the 8th Air Force was still in shock from its losses at Schweinfurt, which Harris must have known. Bomber Command began its Battle of Berlin on the night of November the 18th, 1943. It continued until March 1944. All the while, there was a struggle between Sir Arthur Harris and the air staff. Harris virtually ignored the point-blank directive and concentrated on the destruction of German cities. His boss, Portal, wanted to fire him, but didn't dare. Harris had the support of Winston Churchill. He had relished the destruction of Hamburg and wanted the same for Berlin. Between November and March, Bomber Command would fly 20,224 sorties. Almost half of them were against Berlin. Almost 2,700 aircraft were shot down or heavily damaged. Berlin was a more difficult target than Hamburg. Its area was almost 30 times larger. It was out of range of the British G and Obo navigation and targeting systems. The weather over Germany was miserable for the entire winter. The bombers fought high winds, heavy icing, and the constant concern over night fighters. In the night bombing raids, the importance of crew camaraderie intensified. The pitch black night was illuminated by bursting flak and exploding aircraft. But a system of denial grew up, a belief that the Germans were firing scarecrow shells that looked like exploding bombers they were not. The German night fighters were stalkers, which would edge toward their quarry, totally invisible until they fired at point-blank range.
Despite its losses, Bomber Command's strength grew throughout the bleak winter. Lancasters were being mass manufactured. Air crew were pouring in from the hundreds of training schools scattered around the world. When Harris took over Bomber Command in 1942, he had 59 heavy bombers. By March 1944, he had more than a thousand. But Bomber Command's losses were high. The air staff was staggered when 72 aircraft were lost over Berlin on March 24th. A week later, 976 heavy bombers and 15 mosquitoes were launched on a raid on Nuremberg. 96 aircraft were shot down. 960 crew members were lost in a raid that resulted in 138. German deaths. It was an impossible situation, even for Harris. But fate was about to intervene on two fronts. Politically, the requirements for Operation Overlord, the invasion of Europe, took precedence. Harris was forced to place Bomber Command under General Eisenhower's control. While Bomber Command had been bleeding itself white in the night skies over Germany, the USAAF had done what many considered to be impossible. It had fielded increasing quantities of a long-range escort fighter, the North American Mustang. It had wrested air superiority from the Germans and created an entirely new climate for the air war. Before America entered the war, the Anglo-French Purchasing Commission invited North American aviation to become a second source for building Curtis P-40 fighters. Designer Edgar Schmood believed he could create a more modern aircraft that could be put into production as quickly as the P-40. Schmood sold the idea to his boss, Dutch Kindleberger. Within five weeks, Kindleberger had a contract for 320 aircraft. The prototype was completed in just 102 days. It was soon evident that North American had produced the best American fighter to date, but the U.S. Army Air Forces only bought two for test purposes. The Mustang's Allison engine handicapped its performance at high altitude. When it entered service with the RAF in 1942, it operated as a high-speed, low-altitude reconnaissance aircraft. It was considered by its pilots to be far smoother in all maneuvers than a Spitfire, which was high praise indeed. It was recommended that the Mustang be fitted with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. It was a marriage made in heaven. The Merlin gave the Mustang outstanding high altitude performance. It was faster than the FW-190 and the BF-109 at all heights. But it was still not a long range escort fighter. Even with drop tanks, it could not fly the Berlin mission. An 85-gallon tank was installed, squeezed in behind the pilot. This made the Mustang unstable until some fuel had been burned off. But it now had endurance of seven and a half hours, enough for the round trip to Berlin. The first long-distance escort to Germany was flown on December 13, 1943. It was a round trip of almost a thousand miles, escorting 710 bombers. The Mustang had arrived. The USAAF made the mistake of having its escort fighters fly in close formation with the bombers. Their first duty was to bring the bombers back alive. When General Doolittle took over the 8th Air Force in January 1944, he released the fighters. His philosophy was that the first duty of 8th Air Force fighters is to destroy German fighters. The newfound freedom was applied gradually. Of one of the best wings, of one of the best divisions, of one of the best air forces in the world. It was soon found that sweeps as much as 50 miles from the main bomber stream could catch the Luftwaffe units at their most vulnerable time as they were forming up for an attack. The hunters suddenly became the hunted. One of the benefits of the new tactic was the virtual elimination of the slower twin-engine German fighters that fired deadly rockets into the bomber formations. 
they were now easy prey for the Mustangs. Operation Argument called for the elimination of the Luftwaffe by continuous attrition and by attacks on German fighter and component production. Bad weather hindered the initiation of argument. Twice Doolittle recalled bombers. There was a very real prospect that if a mission was launched and weather shut down the English bases, the entire force would be lost. After the second recall, General Spatz gave Doolittle a severe dressing down. He said, I wonder if you've got the guts to lead a big air force. If you haven't, I'll get someone who has. It was the first and probably the last time anyone had ever questioned Doolittle's guts. On February 19, 1944, the weather over Germany began to clear. Operation Argument was put into play with an intensive series of attacks on German aircraft-related factories. Bomber Command joined the 8th and 15th Air Forces in this series of attacks. The weight of the Allied effort was demoralizing to the Germans. They were capped up all night by the RAF. Then, by day, they had to witness the spectacle of a thousand American aircraft on one mission. Contrails streaming behind the combat boxes of bombers surrounded by fighters. The Mustangs reached out to strike the German fighters as their formations assembled. Then they dropped to the ground to strafe parked aircraft. The German pilots now faced attack at all times, from takeoff to landing. It was the realization of an impossible dream. A fighter with enough range to escort bombers and enough speed and maneuverability to defeat the German fighters. The period between February 19th and February 25th was called Big Week. When it was finished, 10,000 tons of bombs had been dropped, more than the eighth had dropped in the whole of its first year of operations. The fighters had flown 3,673 sorties. Their loss rate was less than 1%. The German Air Force was defeated. It lost more than 2,000 aircraft in February alone. In March, it lost almost the same number. Even the tremendous German production effort could not redress losses of this magnitude because of the staggering air crew losses. After March, there was an obvious decline in the quality of the Luftwaffe pilots. And there was not enough fuel to adequately train replacements. The Luftwaffe's night fighters would continue to fight and win the Battle of Berlin, but they were soon overwhelmed as well. Allied strength grew every day, both in quantity and quality. From February on, the Luftwaffe declined to oppose daylight bombing on a full-scale basis. By April, it was clear that the objectives of operations point blank and argument had been achieved. The Allies had the air superiority needed to permit an invasion. Air superiority had been won by the long-range fighter, using the bomber formations to entice the Luftwaffe to fight. The build-up in Allied air power was still plagued by organizational difficulties. Below the top level of command, there was controversy over territory and personality clashes between leaders. Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mallory was notorious for being difficult to work with. He was air commander of the Allied Expeditionary Air Force. This was made up of the RAF's second tactical air force and fighter command and the US 9th Air Force. Lee Mallory also demanded control of both bomber command and the 8th Air Force. This was resisted 
by Sir Arthur Harris and General Karl Spatz. But their quarrel was diverted by other considerations. Spatz considered German oil production to be the most vulnerable target. He believed that he now had the forces to destroy synthetic oil production in Germany and bring the country to its knees. Harris didn't believe that the oil industry was a better target than any other, but he certainly preferred it to the alternative Lee Mallory supported, concentration on the German transportation system. The idea came from Professor Solly Zuckerman. He was an academic, arguing against two of the most accomplished bomb commanders in history, but he prevailed. Eisenhower and Tedder accepted Zuckerman's proposal. They were convinced that percussion attacks made on 75 selected railway targets in Germany and France would make a crucial difference to the success of the invasion of Europe. On April 14, 1944, Bomber Command and the 8th Air Force were placed directly under General Eisenhower's control. He elected to proceed with Zuckerman's plan, known in bomber circles as Zuckerman's Folly. Bomber Command's precision bombing techniques had improved. The achievement of air superiority had led to a decline in loss rates and had improved conditions for daylight precision attacks. Day, June the 6th, 1944, Allied forces returned to Europe. In the weeks after D-Day, the Allied air forces demonstrated the extent of their crushing air superiority. They flew almost half a million sorties. The Luftwaffe was almost totally suppressed. It was confined to isolated attacks that had no measurable effect. The Allied advance swept the German radar line back. By the end of August 1944, Luftwaffe night fighters had no early warning network. The Allied attack on Germany's fuel supplies took effect. After July, the Luftwaffe's day and night operations were severely curtailed. Air superiority permitted Allied truck convoys to move in closely packed arrays on European roads. They could be confident that any aircraft that appeared overhead was a friend. Air support parties were assigned to each tank column. Soon every tank column was covered by a flight of four fighter bombers as advanced reconnaissance. In August, the Luftwaffe build-up in France threatened General George Patton's Third Army. It was part of Hitler's last desperate attempt to throw the Allies out of France with a counter-attack by German troops and panzers. The German forces were halted by a fierce American resistance on the ground and the combined assaults of hundreds of British and American fighter bombers. Their rockets destroyed the German tank and vehicle concentrations. The German forces were almost encircled in the Falaise Argentin pocket. They made a densely packed target for the concentration of Allied air power overhead. It was so thick that formations had to wait in line for their turn to dive in and attack. German infantrymen complained that their opposite numbers were unwilling to fight until they'd received overwhelming fighter-bomber support. They were right. The Allies had the power and they flaunted it. Germans finally abandoned their equipment and fled on foot. In the meantime, strategic bombing went on day and night. At last, concentration was on the oil industry. The Ploesti oil fields were destroyed. By September 1944, they were occupied.
German production of oil was down to 23% of what it had been only six months before. But the Germans had become expert in the reconstitution of the synthetic oil plants and refineries. They eliminated old safety procedures in the interest of turning out product. The Americans and the British at last combined forces. The 8th and 15th Air Forces hit synthetic oil plants. Bomber Command hammered targets in the Ruhr, where benzol was produced. In the process, an argument was settled. Precision bombing using the Norden bomb site could do more damage with 250 tons of bombs than a radar attack with 1,000 tons. Incredibly, despite the damage, German oil production rose. The Germans could have a destroyed complex working again within a month. By December, the focus of the bombing was shifted from the synthetic oil industry to stopping the German offensive in the Ardennes. But that very offensive was doomed by a shortage of gasoline. Even as old Germany was going up in flames, the German motor vehicle industry reached new peaks of production. But like the aircraft industry, the armored vehicle industry was dispersed. Another path to halting production was to destroy the rail and canal networks that linked subcontractors to the main assembly plants. The strategic bombers took on the rail centers. The tactical fighter bombers, known to the Germans as Jabos from Jagdbomber, cut the rail lines and attacked trains, canal traffic and motor transport. Yet incredibly, amid the rain of bombs and bad news in 1944, German production rose and with it, German inventiveness. The Luftwaffe's fighter arm had seen a vast increase in the numbers of aircraft available to it. The Jägerstab was set up under Albert Speer's Ministry for Armaments and War Production. Under Speer's aegis, monthly fighter production shot up, reaching 3,000 in September 1944. Most of the German fighters were improved models of the aircraft types that had begun the war. A few new models had been introduced. The most important was the Focke Wolf 190. For a long time, sensible development of aircraft had been held back by the inept leadership of Colonel General Ernst Udet. He had been totally unqualified to lead the technical department of the State Ministry of Aviation. His department produced some terrible planes, but it was capable of producing the most advanced aircraft of the war. The Messerschmitt Me-262 jet fighter, with its swept wings, heavy armament, and 540 miles an hour top speed, was easily the best fighter of the war. It was a beautiful aircraft, but its pilots liked it for more than aesthetic reasons. By the time it began to appear in service in late 1944, the Allies dominated the air. The ME-262 gave Luftwaffe pilots at least a slim chance for survival. About 1,433 ME-262s were delivered to the Luftwaffe, but only about 300 got into operation. The rest were destroyed on the production lines or on their way to the combat units. Production of the 262 was delayed because of the difficulty of producing a satisfactory number of the radical new jet engines. There is no question that if the utmost priority had been placed on the development of the jet engine in 1939, the 262 could have entered service in mid-1943. If it had, the air war over Europe would have been vastly different. The Allies would not have won air superiority, nor would they have invaded Europe in 1944. Another German engineering triumph was the Arado AR-234 Blitz. It was the first operational jet bomber and a superb reconnaissance plane. 
It was almost as fast as the ME-262, and it had a greater range. The most radical German aircraft was the Messerschmitt ME-163 Comet. It was a rocket-powered flying wing interceptor. It flew at 624 miles an hour in 1941. That was such a fantastic feat that any self-respecting Allied spy would have refused to believe it. The liquid rocket motor used extremely volatile fuels. Any mishap, even a bounced landing, could cause an explosion. 300 Cometen were built, but they achieved only nine kills in combat, including two probables. The Luftwaffe maintained its recovery powers to the very end. It could still put on brilliant performances, displaying the old initiative and skills. But the war was lost, and the continuing bravery and elan of the Luftwaffe pilots could do nothing to change things. By March 1945, the collapse of the Luftwaffe left the defense of Germany virtually in the hands of 60 Messerschmitt Me-262s of JG-7. By this stage of the war, the range of talent among German jet pilots varied widely. Some were experts with thousands of hours of flying time, others were fresh from flying school. A few were aces, well experienced in the ME-262. A special ME-262 unit of aces, Jagdverband 44, was formed. It got into action quickly and scored some victories. But not even the ME-262 could redress the balance. Time had at last run out for the Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe was defeated because it had not been conceived on a scale grand enough for the gigantic combat in which Hitler embroiled it. It caught the design tide and had the best aircraft available when the war started. But it missed the production tide by two vital years. When aircraft production rose to its peak in 1944, it was too late. The Luftwaffe was also ill-served by its leadership. Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring was derelict in his direction of the Luftwaffe after 1939. Colonel General Ernst Udet was incapable of performing the duties assigned to him. Colonel General Hans Jeschonek was too immature for his responsibilities. With such leaders, even the brilliant Erhard Milch, Adolf Galland and Wolfram von Richthofen could not prevent the Luftwaffe's defeat. All the heroism of the many aces all the selfless duty of the mechanics and the factory workers and all the stoic heroism of the civilian populace were wasted. Dresden, a city of 600,000 people, had been little touched by the war. Its center was a warren of timber houses ready to be burned. Many Dresdeners came to assume that it was Allied policy to spare a city of such immense cultural value. This was naive to say the least. With remorseless efficiency, Bomber Command launched 855 planes against Dresden on the night of February the 13th, 1945. The 8th Air Force would attack on the two following days with a total of 521 bombers. Massive fires erupted. The German and neutral press protested at the extensive damage and loss of life. Official German police records eventually calculated somewhere between 35,000 and 60,000 killed or missing.
The 8th Air Force was unaware of or insensitive to the brewing controversy. It raided Dresden twice more before the end of the war. It focused the attacks on the railroad marshalling yards, which were unquestionably legitimate military targets. There was an eruption of criticism from critics of Sir Arthur Harris's area bombing policy. Harris, the scapegoat of choice, was quick to point out that the Joint Chiefs of Staff had designated Dresden as a primary target because it was a key transportation center. The decision to bomb was officially supported by Stalin, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Eisenhower. It is important to recall the psychology of the time. Germany was a dreaded enemy. Even though Germany lay in ruins, the Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler, commanded the loyalty and respect of his nation and the absolute obedience of his soldiers. No one knew how long the war would go on or how many thousands of people would be killed. Dresden was a military target because it had crucial rail, governmental, and industrial facilities. The Soviet Union wanted it bombed to help the advancement of its armies. Only when Portal and Churchill sensed the public outrage did they attempt to distance themselves from the decision to bomb Dresden. The uproar over Dresden finally convinced Bomber Command that it had run out of targets. Area bombing was formally ended on April 16, 1945. The last major attack by the 8th Air Force occurred on April 25th. It was a raid on airfields, rail targets, and the Skoda armament works in Czechoslovakia. In the days following, leaflet dropping and supply missions were flown. The 8th engaged in evacuating liberated prisoners of war. Then it stood down to prepare itself to move on to the Pacific for the assault on Japan. The air war was over in Europe. All the major German military figures said unequivocally that Allied air power was chiefly responsible for Germany's defeat. <laughs> 